Hello and welcome to another episode of the podcast that promotes peace, happiness, and radicalism. Your queer story. We are running for president, people. Get ready. What peace, happiness, and radicalism? I don't know. <laughs> Riots and uprisings. I just went for it. You know what? Like did. whatever word came out of my mouth came out. It could have said anything. Who knows? But. Who, yeah. Um. I. You know, if we ever do a second podcast with all the time that we have, I was thinking we should do like radicals and riots. You know, like like people that change the world, revolutionaries, radicals, revolutionaries, and riots. There you go. Now someone's going to steal our name. Yeah, they're going to no. steal that. You can have it because I can't even remember that. You can, uh, <laughs> it's RRR. Come on. Radicals, revolutionaries. And... You're going to break the fucking the, program. You, anytime I slightly raise my voice, I can't help it that I know how to project. Anyways, I've been listening to... Um, uh, African American and Latinx history of the United States, and it's very good, very eye opening. Well, link me that, huh? Link me that. Link it to you? Yeah, I can't link it to you. Why? Because it's in my Audible app. Oh, yeah, but you should. I can share it to you if you have an Audible app. Well, I might get an Audible app just to listen to that. You should because it's fucking fantastic. It's By also the way, horrifying. Go to audibletrial.com dot com slash queer for yeah. your free thirty day trial of audible <laughs> and, and get that book that everyone's talking about that's right yeah the uh, african-american and the latinx history of the united states because it tells a whole other story did you know that after they freed the slaves they then had areas where it was illegal for the slaves to live in so it's like oh you're free but you're not allowed to live here anymore and then they would have lash laws and every six months that uh freed slave was still living there um, they would get like thir- 20 to 30 lashes just for because they're like, you need to get out of here. I knew they had like segregation and things like that. I didn't know yeah. that they were like, you can't live here. Exclusion and I laws. I definitely yeah. didn't know that they would like basically whip them. Not, not if, basically. They did whip yeah, them. <laughs> I, I didn't know that they would whip them. If yeah. They, were like, they would find them um, and whip them for for still living there. That Yeah. I had no idea. That's, yeah. And people are, yeah, people are like, pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. Like, we're, we're going to free you, but you can't own any land, and you can't live here anymore, and you can't, good luck. You, you can't do anything. Yeah. Um, you can't have any jobs either. Yeah, you can't have any jobs. Uh, I mean, you can come and clean my house if you'd like, and you're not going to make any money, but right. uh, I mean, I guess I'll let you live here if you do that. Yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you live here. It's I'll pay you the exact same pennies, thing. and you're going to work 16 hours a day, mm-hmm. and you'll still barely have enough to feed yourself, but sure. Sure. I don't know why you're complaining about right. being what, set back. Wow, you're free now. What's <laughs> what are the you problem? talking about? Reparations? Where you for what? Anyways, um, but yeah, I don't, that has nothing to do with today's topic. But just throwing out what I'm reading. I just got a a message from someone. It's a long message. Okay, all right. Never mind. That has nothing to do with this. So, um, welcome to our world listeners. It's finally happened. You know who made it happen? All the people around the whole world Jesus. that are listening to us because uh, I have a list of like all the countries that have tuned in. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, it's pretty fucking long. Yeah. We had a, a couple weeks ago, we had a new listener from Norway tune into our Facebook and say thank you for our podcast. So- I thought... Honestly, starting this off, I was like, ah, my family might listen to it, and we might get like a few local Rhode Islanders who listen to it. We're worldwide, everyone. Worldwide. We've got Norway. We've got Australia. We've got Britain. We've got- Germany. Uh, Germany. We've got a lot of little islands. We've got our listener in Russia. Hang in there, buddy. We've got some <laughs> islands. We've got some places in Africa. We've got literally like pretty much every continent covered. Yeah. So- um yeah spreading that queer message and we're saying thank you to our world listeners this month and we're doing some topics specifically on people around the world and we're kicking it off with a guy that's suddenly become very relevant we didn't mean to but alan turing this, and a, we planned on covering him from day one yeah um, we've had, just, literally been saying for a year you know we're gonna cover him we're it just so him. happened that uh when we decided to do a world month that he started to blow up again. Yeah, that's right. It was really um, sad, but I was on Twitter and some guy, <laughs> because this is like so typical of like the of liberals. I will say this. This is very typical of us. So like they posted that Alan Turing was going to be the face of the $50 or the 50 pound, mm-hmm. sorry, dollar, 
the 50 we're gonna pound mess that note. up at least yeah we are this episode. we're americans you guys know us we suck um the 50 pound note anyways and this guy comes on and goes oh wow another cis het straight man way to go and then his Im- comments immediately blew up with being like, um, he was gay and he yeah. had a tragic ending. So, and then it just kept going from there. But I suggested that he listen to our podcast so he could learn more. There you go. See, get that little shameless plug in whenever you can. <laughs> I, I, figured- I play a lot of games, right? And uh, next to my name in the game, it'll say like the name of your team. And I'm in a team called Gays. Mm. So whenever anybody comments on it, they're like, oh, my God, gays, yay, I'm gay, too. I'm like, well, since you're gay, <laughs> yeah, I'm like typing this. By to the way. Listen to you. That's probably how we got that Russian listener. Yeah, that's I'm like, probably. I'm like, if you're interested in podcasts, I run a podcast called Your Queer Story. You should check it out. And most people are probably like, I'm blocking this guy because he's fucking annoying. But <laughs> hey, who knows? Maybe somebody's tuned in. Yeah, you never know. You never know. I, I, I still, I'll plug I'll, myself. I'll plug it anywhere. I'll plug anything. All the time. Plugs are the best. Yes, they are. Um, so, yeah. So, anyway, so we're covering Alan Turing today. Mm-hmm. He from is the Great Britain. Father of computing. The father of computing and the father of AI. Mm-hmm. Artificial intelligence. The world is coming to an end actually because of Alan did Turing. You, we're going off on a lot of tangents. What? But did you see that Elon Musk is actually working on inventing something that you implant into your brain so that it syncs with your smartphone? Oh, okay, that's called the mark of the beast. I don't know if you know anything about Christianity, but that's the mark of the beast, and that is a sign of the end times. So if you want to play with your soul like that, you go right the fuck ahead. Yeah, and I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. But then I was like reading the article, and it was like, um, but whichever company like invents it and you hook up to your brain is going to have complete access to all of your thoughts and brain thoughts, like all of your brain processing and everything. And I was like... I don't need anybody to know. That's a I kill think. switch in your head. I was like, anytime I the government wants you gone, just a boom, they're going to hit that. <laughs> it was just like a little shock. <laughs> exactly. <I'm>, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that's such a great idea. And then I'm like, I don't want people having information on all of my thoughts. That's I think a some horrible I think idea. some things that nobody needs to know. Let about. me tell you how that plays out. First of all, they're going to watch all the porn that you watch. And then one day when you're running for office one day, <laughs> you're going to jail. I was going to say, like what? They're going to hack into your thoughts and they're going to reject them. That's going to be the way the presidential races look 30 years from now. Yeah, that's true. Where people are like, you're screaming. I'm not screaming. I'm just trying to be close to the microphone. Okay, that's much better. Anyways, I'm just saying the presidential races. Oh, yeah. They're going to like gonna, just pull it up and it's going to be a, a screen. It's like in the in the slant. The slander commercials, whatever they yeah, are. Yeah. It's, it's going to be sc- like literal videos of your like of your, memory or yeah, your thoughts or your like thoughts, all that. All the awful things that you ever think. Like, no. Mm-mm. No <laughs> fucking way. No, thank you, Elon Musk. What What is he doing? What is he thinking? Right. I don't. I don't. How can he claim to? What is, what is the, the benefit of that? Um, well, the first benefit he said was to help people who are like paralyzed and stuff. He thinks okay. it might like improve their motor skills. And then the other one is to, he was basically like increase your memory, help you like store thoughts and things like that. Uh I'm not interested in it. I thought it was a great idea. And then I thought about the fact that a company would have information to everything I see, think, hear, like my feelings. Nope. I will live with my shitty memory. It's fine. I'm already, yeah. I'm pretty sure I have early onset Alzheimer's. So yeah, same here. So Paul and I are going to end up in a home in like 50 years, both with dementia. Hey, as long as we're together. Yeah, it's fine. Imagine I'm though, sure we will be because both of our partners will have kicked us out and been like, we're no, we're done. Mm-hmm. We're done with you. We'll have done 67 podcasts by that time <laughs> <laughs> on well, all kinds of topics. Dementia cast. It's a oh, podcast of good. us talking about nothing. <laughs> we because- just do the same thing over and over. It's basically this podcast, but it's more frequent. <laughs> <laughs> every episode's the same topic. <laughs> You know what? But all of and our every listeners, episode says episode one. <laughs> episode one. <laughs> Finally, ready to get this 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 podcast kicked off. But all of our listeners will also have dementia, so they're going to be thrilled with it every time. There you go. That's that's the kick right there. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyways, uh, we shouldn't make fun of t- people. With no, dementia, just but. so you know, we've both experienced loss due to that, and yes, uh, our humor is a way to deal with it. We're not. We've we've both had personal experiences with it. Yes. It's not, we're not yeah. just roasting random. We're not diseases. just roasting random people. We are really serious. We are going to both have dementia. It's it's a definite in my family. So, um, anyways, 
Um, yeah, so let's get on to the great world of Great Britain, the UK, United Kingdom, also known as... Um, I don't think those are the same thing. England. Are those the same thing? United Kingdom? Yes, it is. Thing. Oh my God, you're starting off a... You're st- Listen, my geography class, I had one in my whole life, and all we did was watch Roots. <laughs> I literally I know. Like, until I was like 23 I thought Brazil was an island next to Cuba. I literally learned no geography in my entire Well, you've just schooling. insulted all the British people well, that I'm listen sorry. here. I just want to make sure we're getting things right is all. <laughs> okay. All right. We're heading over to the land of England today, listeners, specifically to the district of Maida Vale in the city of Westminster. Probably said that wrong, sorry. In the northern part of Paddington of West London. Yeah, they, I don't, I don't get a, England. That's a very specific, like... Well, is what, that is, like, what is all... In, what is this? Because the, first of all, they were like, they're in Maida Vale. So I'm saying, thinking like, oh, like the city of Maida Vale. And they're like, in the city of Westminster. So I'm like, okay, that's that's part of Maida Vale. And they're like, in the northern part of Paddington of West London. And we're still not even like... And that's in London's a city in itself in fucking England. <laughs> so what is this? Yeah, what how know. how do you have the split they up? Get re- Imagine writing your address. <laughs> <laughs> is it just neat? like I, mean, I live comes- <laughs> on one oh two West Drive, um, Maida Vale, Westminster, Paddington, West London. England. And then like yeah, England. And then <laughs> you flip over the envelope and on the back you write England. <laughs> uh, so here on June twenty third, nineteen twelve, Alan Turing was born. Uh, Alan Turing was born to a family of modest means and civil service. Alan had one older brother, John, and the two would spend much of their childhood away from their parents. Julius Turing was stationed in India as a government employee of Great Britain. However, wanting their sons to grow up in London, Julius and Ethel left their boys with a retired military couple. I had an Ethel. An, huh? I had an Ethel. You had an Ethel who? Like my great-great-grandma. Oh, really? mm mm-hmm. Oh. I've, n- I've never had an Ethel, although I know Ethel Mertz from I Love Lucy. Also, um, this is that good old uh, English colonialism so hard at work in the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. It's got to be everywhere. It just got to be. <laughs> As a young child, it became quickly apparent that Alan was a genius. While his teachers noted his brilliance, it seems his he advanced through school at a normal pace before heading off to Sherborne School. Sherborne was founded in 705 CE or AD, depending on what you use for your calendar, but Jesus fucking Christ, and has remained in the same location for over 1300 years. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> do you think they have funding to like uh, keep it up and they must because if that was in america let me tell you something that would be a rundown piece of shit uh, uh, and all the kids of yep. color would be attending it yep <laughs> it is even said that alfred the great was once a student at sherborne it is listed in the top one percent of all schools in england so needless to say alan received a top-notch education at sherborne however it does not seem that his teachers fully grasped it does seem no, it does not. Oh, I, t- I did say it does seem. I'm sorry, but I meant to say it does not seem. I knew what I was going to say. However, it does not seem that his teachers fully grasped Turing's potential. An old institute, Sherborne valued classical education, and Allen seemed preoccupied with science and perceived fantasy. By age 16, Allen was reading and understanding Einstein's work, yet his teachers dismissed this as science specialists and wasting his education. Um, yeah, who needs that science? What's that? Sheet? Newfangled science stuff. Let's read some more literature from the 1500s. Yep. Because Sherborne was was and is an all-boys boarding school, Alan received an education in a few areas. In <laughs> 1928, at 16, Alan met another science nut and fellow genius, Christopher Morcom. The two both bonded over their love for math and science, and no doubt the feeling of being outsiders in a school which valued classical training above modern conceptions. Alan once wrote to his mother about Christopher, I am sure I could not... I don't know why he has that accent. (laughs) No, he wouldn't. He would have an English accent. I am sure I could not have found anywhere another companion so brilliant and and yet so charming and unconceited. I regarded my interest in my work and in such things as astronomy, to which he introduced me, as something to be shared with him, and I think he felt a little the same about me. His first crush. It was his first crush. It is obvious that Alan was in love with Christopher, but we do not know how deep their relationship actually went. So we know that they had a relationship. Like mm-hmm. there's, It's heavily documented. 
Um, some people say that it was unrequited love, but other people think that they definitely had something going on. I don't know. Either way, you're at an all boys boarding school. Come on. There's some stuff going on. There is some stuff There's going on. There's been a lot of semen spilt in those halls over oh, the 1600 years. So, so much. The two began studying for college and Christopher, oh wow, see, what am I writing? I don't know. This is why I have problems reading the script. People think I don't know how to read, but the really, oh, the that, reality that is That last you, paragraph that you were stumbling over was perfectly the clear. The reality is you don't know how to write. Bitch. Oh. The two began studying for college and Chris won a scholarship for Trinity College at the beginning of 1930. Alan was denied the scholarship and was heartbroken to be separated from his friend. Unfortunately, he would be further heartbroken when Chris suddenly died on February 13th, 1930, which he died of uh, Bovarian, um, uh, what was it, pneumonia or something? I don't know, but it was really weird because he had drank some corrupt milk years earlier and it put like this uh, pesticide or whatever in pesticide? him. Pesticide? Not pesticide. <laughs> parasite? A, parasite. You know, same thing. It's a good old cult <laughs> he, teach in there. Shut up. It put this parasite in him. And then like three years later, just he just dropped dead. Wow. Like, see, here I am eating shit that I'm like, this is probably not good to eat, but I'll be fine. No and then idea. I'm good like a week later. I'm like, yeah, I made it. Who knows? <laughs> nope. Who knows? No clue. Um, yeah, but not, yeah. So the death of his friend would plague Alan for years and really all of his life, prompting him to question matter and life after death and eventually inspiring his 1932 essay on the nature of the spirit, which used quantum physics to explain what happens to our consciousness after death. In practical terms, Alan was an atheist seeking spiritual meaning for his friend's death. He would write to his mother about Christopher's passing. I fear that I shall meet Morecambe again somewhere, and that there will be some work for us to do together, as there was for us to do here. It never seems to have occurred to me to make other friends besides Morecambe. He made everyone else seem so ordinary. Um, and this I is do, why you just need one friend in life. That's right, and that's why Paul and I will have no clue what to do when one of us dies. <laughs> <laughs> mm, be in up. 50 years but i do want to i did want to comment on like because um alan was an atheist and um like i think a lot of people get confused that if you're an atheist you can't be spiritual mm -hmm. and i don't know at least for me they're two different things yeah they're i think they're two different things because i feel like atheism is the lack in the belief of a god or a higher power but you can still believe in like I don't know because I kind of, I don't know what I believe. Honestly, I've started to yeah. question shit as I get older because I, I don't know if it's from fear of death or yeah. from what I started to question things, but I think atheism and spiritualism are separate things. Yeah. They're very separate for me. Like I find, I find like spiritualism can be like a connection with another person. It can be connection with nature. You know, it can be just, I don't know, and finding strength and courage. Like those are like in meditation. Like I feel like there's like what we would consider spiritual connection. I just don't believe that there's a being in the heavens that oversees that. Mm -hmm. And this was really big in Alan's life because this will come into play like 20 years later. But like, but like him, he went on the search to understand how the consciousness could continue. You know, but he doesn't believe in a God. He doesn't believe that he's going to see his friend again in heaven, but he believes that there's a way for consciousness to continue. And that would play a role and later in his life. that's where I'm at in my life. I'm yeah. like, what happens to consciousness? That's, that's where a lot of my anxiety comes from these <laughs> days as I'm peeling my nails. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I didn't mean to make everyone have an anxiety attack. Good. Another result of Christopher's death was a renewed motivation by Alan to excel in his studies and carry on the research he and Chris had dreamed about. In 1931, Turing was accepted to King's College, a branch of the University of Cambridge, to study mathematics. As he left Sherborne, a teacher wrote, He must remember that Cambridge will want sound knowledge rather than vague ideas, most likely ref referring to Alan's outlandish fantasies of building a universal a universal machine. After completing his undergraduate in 1934, Turing was elected to the King's Fellowship Program and began his dissertation on the Central Limit Theorem, which would eventually inspire his well-known 1936 thesis titled Computable Numbers with an application to the... That's not a misspelling. Entschuldigungs problem, meaning decision problem. Einstein. It's spelled E N T S C H E I D U N G S P R O B L E M. 
<laughs> so put that in a spelling bee. <laughs> later, can you his, use that in a sentence, please? <laughs> <laughs> later, his thesis would simply be known as Turing's proof, and would lay the foundation for that universal machine. This machine would later be built and become known to this day as the Turing machine, an essential and fundamental mechanic for today's computer. So he came up. With, I don't know if he came up with this name, but like. I can't even say it. That's why I am not able to um, invent computers. No, the in, the instant dunk problem or whatever was I from somewhere else. I think it was from Einstein. Well, he solved it, so. But he, he just presented. <laughs> I don't even know what that um, sentence said. A way said. to use it. There's a lot about <laughs> Turing that I can't tell. I can't explain it to you. So I'm sorry, people. If you are a math whiz out there or you're a computer nerd, I would suggest that you read his biography because as I was reading and studying, like I couldn't, I wanted to break these things down, but I couldn't understand them to break them down. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what the central limit theorem is. I have no fucking clue, but I know that the, like he used all of this as a basic for the Turing machine, which is a mechanic, is a mechanism that we use to this day in, in computers. So not only did he understand these things, he combined all of them to invent something. And which, created something better. Like, that, how that, do people do this? Like, yeah, how, know. how did someone make the cloud? Who fucking knows? I I don't know how the internet works. I couldn't begin to tell you how the internet worked, but somehow someone somewhere made the internet, and, and that then, blows my fucking and mind. And the human race put porn on it. <laughs> and then we like, did. Oh, but we're like, look, we don't understand this, but we know how to put naked pictures up there, so we're going to do that. Yep. Do you think that people were that blown away when they saw the wheel? Like, Do you think that when they like someone presented the wheel, people were like... I don't know if when they invented the wheel, but I feel like when they put the wheel and used it in something, like created something where they could move things, people were probably like, people are like, what the fuck? Fire. Fire would have blown my mind. Mm. That would have creeped me the fuck out. Well, you'd also thought that there was black fire. I did believe there was black fire. And can you imagine if there was black fire? Because that would really be creepy. (laughs) You don't know. You're going to be walking around. You're just going to walk into black fire. Okay. (laughs) Whatever. You know what? If you read the Bible instead of being a heathen. I tried to read the Bible once. I was like, I'm going to be a good human, and I'm going to read this. And I read one sentence, and I was like, no. (laughs) You just need to read the right books. I'm bumping things again. You need to read the right books. If you read Judges, you would enjoy the Bible. It's basically Game of Thrones. But if you're going to read, like, Chronicles, then you've... I don't know. I picked up one book. I don't know which one it was. It just said the Bible. You said the begats. It was like the one that you get at the hotel. The Gideon Um, Bible, yeah. And then um, I I opened to a random page, and it was like different paragraphs with different numbers on top and each one was just like a sentence that made no sense i told you that's psalms you read psalms i don't know what any of that means but it was weird it's poetry you Mm. it's poetry okay where are you reading i think it's your turn oh is it yeah it is my turn Anyways, so Allen continued his studies at Princeton, interning under one of the top mathematicians of the day. By 1938, he had earned his doctorate in in mathematics, mathematics, and developed an electromechanical binary calculator. I don't know what the fuck that is either. (laughs) Well, fuck if I... No, it's, it's sad when, <laughs> when the person you're going to school with makes things that are more complicated than your whole fucking degree. Literally. <laughs> he also began studying cryptology around this time. And when World War II broke out in 1939, Allen was moved to the headquarters of Britain's Code and Cipher School in Bletchley Park, which is basically the UK's CIA for us Americans. Um, if I'm wrong about that, Englanders... Go ahead and correct me, but from what I, it seems to me, it was like the secret mm-hmm. service of the UK. Alan and his team were facing the Germans' formidable code machine Enigma. This was a machine which created a code allowing the Nazis to communicate with each other over enemy lines, and it looked like a weird typewriter. Yeah, and they could like turn things, and depending yeah. on which way you turned it, it was a whole different code. So it exactly. was like codes inside of codes inside of codes. It was it was almost it was basically unbreakable. Yeah, you know. Um, and while the Polish and French had made a dent in deciphering Enigma, updates to the machine had proven frustrating. So every time that they would start to break it, um, the Germans would just kind of update it, mm-hmm. tinker with it, and then like you were, were starting over at square one again. Yep. So the Brits at Bletchley Park decided to take a crack at the code. Alan was known to be a bit eccentric, though he was loved. He often ran the 40 miles to and from his meetings in London. Why? I mean, he had a lot of energy, apparently. Apparently. And you know what? I To this day, I don't get runners. If you are a runner, good. If I've you're always listening wanted to us to while you're running. I've always wanted to be yeah. a runner because I'm like, they have 
you know, they stay in shape. They're really healthy. They don't get worn out. They seem happy. They, all those endorphins yeah. being released. But I just can't do it. I've tried. Mm-mm. I've tried downloading those apps like Couch to 5K <laughs> where it's like you got to do it three <laughs> times a week. And I just have no motivation. Um, he, he was quite a runner. He was quite an exceptional runner, in fact, and even tried out for the Olympics one year. He just had a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> Apparently. However, he suffered an injury and was disqualified. Alan oversaw Hut 8 at the park, and his employees and co-workers affectionately called him Professor 1. Prof- no, they perfect- affectionately called him Prof. Like and, affectionately, prof. Oh, or and, affectionately, and co-workers affectionately called him pro- Prof. One individual described him as such. In the first week of June each year, he would get a bad attack of hay fever, and he would cycle to the office wearing a service gas mask to keep the pollen off. It's a bit extreme. His bicycle had a fault. <laughs> The chain would come off at irregular intervals. Instead of having it mended, he would count the number of times the pedals went around and would get off the bicycle in time to adjust the chain by hand. Another of his eccentricities is that he chained his mug to the radiator pipes to prevent it being stolen. His, like, his coffee mug? I think so. <laughs> That's extreme. That's, That's a lot. lot. Like, Imagine you're like, okay, I know that I can spin my wheels 500 <laughs> times. After the 500th time, time. it's going to pop off. So I got to stop off at 499, readjust my chain, and get back on. That's... That's just going through your mind. I mean, this is a numbers guy, so it's just his mind must just constantly be in this loop You know of the numbers. one number thing I do is when I go up or down stairs, I count the number of stairs. Yeah. Weird. I know at my house I have 13 stairs. That's I don't weird. know. Like, also, that's an unlucky number. That's why you fall down the stairs. All I've time. only fell down three times. <laughs> um, but that's the only thing. Like, I don't know why. Anytime I go up any stairs, I count them in my head. Weird thing I do, but this guy took it to another level. He did. And I, I, I do love that he um, chains his mug to the radiator. So if you're sitting at work and you've got that asshole that's always still in your favorite coffee mug, now Who you know that? what to I do. I would never want to drink out of somebody else's mug. I that's know. Weird. weird. Well, there's like, there will be offices where people have like a communal coffee and then uh, people just naturally claim a cup. They're like, this is my favorite cup. Well, and I've just take that. had, we have communal coffee at my work, but I brought in my own cup from home. But what if someone's drinking out of your cup when you're not there? That's really fucking weird. Yeah, that's I why leave you it need at my to desk. be chained really, to your I have a really gay <laughs> mug. I don't think anybody else is going to use it. It's <laughs> a little cartoon bunny with glasses mm-hmm. and a bow, like a girl yeah. bunny. I don't think anybody else is going to touch it. Uh, I don't know if it's that. That's not that gay. A girl would take that. What you need is like a big penis. Uh, and then you remember that big sipper that I got for Katie? Yes. Where it was like a boob? Mm-hmm. That's what you need. No one's and just going to be taking I'll that. have to go sit with HR. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, whatever. So by the spring of 1940, Allen and his team had designed their own machine, the Bombi, to crack an enig- enigma. And it was actually because the Polish had dis- had invented a sh- machine called the Bomba. And so, real creative, they're like, the Bombi. Mm-hmm. So, the Bombi was mostly designed by Turing, and he conceived the bulk of his inspiration in one night. Like, it literally is like one of those movies where, like, he had a breakthrough mm. and, like, he, like, designed the whole thing. The machine worked and within two years was intercepting over 40,000 messages a day. By the end of the war, that number would increase to 84,000 messages with two codes broken every minute. Allen also designed a second machine to crack the Germans' new coder called Tuni. Um, so, like, it, there was a separate thing where, like, the German naval... Um, code enigma whatever was even harder to break so he also broke that it was once said that alan turing knew what hitler's messages were before hitler did and most importantly his work in code breaking is said to have ended the war at least two years earlier saving millions of lives for his service alan was made an officer of the most excellent order of the british empire which is a very British title. It is. I want that order. <laughs> I don't know. The most excellent order. It was the highest civilian honor in England. One other incident happened while Alan was at Hut 8. He began dating and then proposed to fellow scientist Joanne Clark. Joanne was also a graduate of Cambridge, quite a mathematician. It might be Joan. Oh. Is it Joan or Joanne? That's Joan. That's Joan. He began dating and then proposed to fellow scientist Joan Clark. Joan was also a graduate of Cambridge, quite a mathematician herself, and gave Alan a run for his money. It's not surprising to know that she was one of only two female cryptologists at Bletchley. And while she's never been seen as been as publicly recognized as her male colleagues, Clark did receive numerous awards and praises for her work. It is no wonder the two geniuses would find an interest with each other. It seems that Alan truly loved Joan and that this is what 
and this is why he proposed to her. Yet a few weeks later, he admitted to Clark that he was a homosexual. Despite this, the two scientists attempted to make things work. No doubt they realized there were a few... Uh, there were a few options for Alan, and Joan did not seem at all distressed by this revelation that he was gay. In fact, she didn't even seem surprised. Ultimately, though, it appears that Alan felt it would be unfair for him to marry Joan, and the engagement was called off. Six years later, Joan would marry a retired army officer. Yeah, and and um, if you've ever seen the movie Imitation Game with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and Keira Knightley, Keira Knightley plays Joan, and I think it was her like great niece said that Kira Knightley was too pretty to play Joan. <laughs> that was me. I just let it go. What the fuck? Right. Your aunt gets to be remembered as a super hot woman right. who was also a brilliant. Like, just let her be remembered that way. Yep. But um, it, yeah, it was is it, it was really. I mean, it was sweet, but it was also sad. Um, yeah. the way there was something else in there, but I don't remember. Um, I don't remember what it was. But yeah, she was she was an incredibly brilliant woman, and obviously, no doubt, held back because of her gender. Oh, absolutely! But, you know, it was kind of like what our situation was going to be way back when if we had stayed in Indiana forever. You know, we have to get married and settle down, yep. pretend. Yep. <laughs> right. Despite his grand success with the Enigma codes, Alan could not boast of his accomplishments because they were top secret. He finished his war tenure at the notorious Bell Labs. Yes, the name stems from Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, who invested his money in the laboratory. And then in 1945, Allen began working for National Physical Laboratory, NPL, at Bushy Park in Teddington, also located in West London, in England. Mm -hmm. Here, Turing created his designs for ACE, the automatic computing engine. While there was a lot of excitement around ACE, Allen was now in the world of corporations and not a high-level government employee, which meant he spent the next two years waiting for funding for his computer. Finally becoming irritated, Turing took a year off to study at Cambridge and then took a position as head of mathematics department at Victoria University in Manchester. In 1949, he became the deputy director of the Computing Machine Laboratory. No doubt all of this bouncing around showed a sign of a restlessness in the still young inventor. I would have been annoyed as hell if he was my teacher because you know he was just going to, he's so smart. Mm -hmm. And like, I know I could not ever understand anything he was saying. It was, it would have been so stressful. Right. You're just like, I mean, I can't like, I can't even read his titles of his fucking papers. Right? Exactly. Just really like sitting there in class, staring at him. Like right. Trying to understand off. anything. <laughs> so while Alan had been job hunting, the National Physical Laboratory had designed the first computer pa based on the concept of the Turing machine. While her head of computing machine laboratory, Alan designed the input output system for the computer and developed the programming along with writing the world's first programming manual. Two years later, his system would be installed in the first ever marketable digital computer. It was also during this time that a few concepts came full circle for Alan. Still searching for a way to explain how consciousness survives and is created, Alan created the theory of AI, which stands for artificial intelligence. He hypothesized that the human brain is just a large digital computer, and he predicted that one day computers would be just as conscious as humans. He even developed a criteria, the Turing test, to test a computer's intelligence against a human's. Yeah. So there you go. He basically is trying to start Terminator. It, well, no, he actually predicted that by like the year 2000, people would take their computers for walks the way that they take their babies or their dogs for walks. And uh, guess He's what? Like, you take your computers to more places than just for walks. <laughs> well, that's true. But he, I mean, in his mind, it was like you were going to like, not like it was going to be walking with you, but like, like you would physically like have a relationship with your computer. Um, Although we are having sex we, bots. Yeah. Those will be interesting. Yeah. Um, and I have a physical relationship with my computer. My phone goes with me everywhere I go. Yeah, that's true. It was just in a different way than yeah. he perceived. But yeah, uh, and in a sense, it is true. And eventually, I guess they're going to be implanted into our head. So you know how they said they would do it? <laughs> they're going to drill a small something millimeter hole in your head. And it's the thing is going to go into your head and it's going to connect and it's going to block mm -hmm. the hole. And then you're going to wear a little computer around your ear, like a little clip. Uh -huh. It doesn't go into you. It just sits there. And then it wirelessly transmits from there, connects from your ear, a little clip thingy to uh -huh. your smartphone. Mm -mm. No, mm, not doing any of that. I'm ever. not doing it either. He said it was going to be like a LASIK procedure, which I had yeah. LASIK and it wasn't that bad, but still no. No. It Imagine, okay, we're going to drill your head now. No, I'm <laughs> telling you, this is literally how they just kill you. They can just hit a button and you're going to drop dead. There's or a movie with that. Or somebody's going to into it. 
yeah, someone's going to hack into it. Like anything could happen. It's bullshit. Don't do it, it, people. Don't do it. (laughs) 10 years from now, we're going to all do it. With his professional career finally taking off again and his programming now in the first consumer computer, Alan was feeling pretty high. In December of 1951, when he was 39 years old, he met 19-year-old Arnold Murray. The two met by chance one day on a walk. One author wrote of the encounter, Alan invited him, Murray, to lunch in the restaurant across the road. Fair and with blue eyes, undernourished and with his thin hair already receding, desperate for better things and more receptive than so many educated people, Arnold touched Alan's soft spot for lost lambs as well as other chords. I don't know what that means. Sounds sexual. That's ex- I think that's exactly what it's meant to be. Okay. <laughs> it's a, such a soft spot for those who are lost, but also um, for those who want to get their dick sucked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a few weeks later, Arnold came over to Alan's house. And then a few days later after that, they spent the night together. Apparently, Alan offended Arnold when he offered to give him cash. Whether Turing was simply trying to help the unemployed young man or whether he was used was used to paying for his sex we do not know like literally we have almost we have so much information about um his successes his like career mm-hmm. but like nothing about his personal life we know about christian Moore. Yeah, we be know about secretive Arnold. about it well yeah obviously he, he did do anything yeah so we don't know i mean maybe if he was just hooking up with people or what mm-hmm. it was i mean obviously he had, had relationships with people but it uh, doesn't seem like he had any real relationship mm-hmm. So the matters were made worse when Alan found out that 10 marks, I think it was supposed to be 10 pounds, were missing from his wallet. I don't know, because I don't know how the the currency sign for, for, sorry, England. Um, I don't know how it works, which just goes to show how ignorant we are, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) He accused Arnold of stealing the money, which Arnold denied. But then just a week later, Arnold asked to borrow some cash. On January 23rd, 1952, so now just about a month after they met, Allen's house was burglarized. He reported the burglary to the the police. A few days later, Arnold showed back up and confessed that a friend of his had robbed Turing. He's a 19-year-old kid. Yeah. Come on, dude. Exactly. I mean, well, one or two things could. I mean, um, uh, Arnold could have robbed him. Mm -hmm. Arnold and his friend could have robbed him. Or Arnold could have told a friend about it. I mean, he's he's unemployed. It sounds like he was kind of living on the streets. Mm -hmm. And the friend could have been like, hey, well, if you're not going to take money from this guy, I'm going to. Right. It could have been any of that. Either way, the two lovers made up. And the next morning, Alan went back to the police with the new information. And Alan, you can see he's very naive here because he, like, honestly thinks, oh, well, I'm a good bloke. They're not going to do anything to me. I'll just go right down over there and I'll tell yep. the police what happened and they will fix it all. Yeah. I've been out to Turing. Arnold's friend, Harry, had already been picked up by the police. Harry had been arrested on a, another charge, and his fingerprints matched those taken in Alan's house. Perhaps the officers were tipped off by Harry. Perhaps they were suspicious because Harry was a homosexual. Either way, the police began to grill Alan on his relationship with Harry and Harry's friend Arnold. Finally, Turing admitted he was having an affair with Arnold Murray. The officer was con- coerced. The officers then coerced Alan into writing a five-page statement full of every detail of his affair with Murray. Like. Write five pages of everything that's happened in the three encounters you've had. Right. Mm, Clock off. Wonder what's mm-hmm. going on. Someone's jerking off in the evidence yeah, room. Yeah, seriously. After locking Alan up, the police picked up Arnold and charged both men with gross indecency. It seems that in all of this, Alan did not think he was actually he would actually wind up in deep trouble. This was his first ever arrest, and he told the officers that Parliament was sure to legalize homosexuality soon. And while waiting for his trial, Alan wrote to Joan to tell her he'd been caught sleeping with another man, but not to worry. They're not as savage as they used to be, he wrote in the letter. Yeah, really underestimating. Yeah. Yeah, but it was the whole thing is that, yeah, he's very naive. He thinks he's going to get off. Like what? He's a government employee. Mm -hmm. He's a war hero. You know, I mean, he thinks he has all these things going for him. On March 31st, 1952, Allen was found guilty of indecency and given the choice of prison or chemical castration. Murray was also found guilty but given a conditional discharge with no further immediate punishments. I don't know what the difference is. I don't know if it's because he was younger or what. Mm-hmm. Turing was forced to undergo estrogen injections for a year. He became impotent and saw various changes to his body such as breast development. He also suffered deeply with depression and isolation, as well as huge professional losses. Um, I did read that some people said that he kind of like laughed off the whole thing Mm -hmm. and like shrugged it off. But I mean, 
I can't imagine. Well, the whole thing with depression is you're going to hide it. Like, right. Any, if you see anybody, the most depressed people are always perceived to be the happiest on right. the outside. And what are you supposed to do when you have something like, I mean, you're publicly shamed. You like it was the next thing is he, his uh, security clearance was stripped and he was forbidden from working for the British government mm-hmm. ever again. Like, what are you supposed to do? So he, people are like, oh, he he was fine with it. He just kind of laughed it off and thought oh, right. these things happened. But that's a pretty intense a traumatic he had experience. To survive somehow. Yeah. So he wrote to a friend of this time saying, I am both bound over for a year and obliged to take this organotherapy therapy for the same period. It is supposed to reduce sexual urge whilst it goes on. The psychiatrist seems to think it is useless to try and do any psychotherapy. Alan finished his course order his court ordered hormone treatment in March of fifty three. However, he was never the same. He began he began experimenting with chemicals for a new kind of research, but on june eighth, nineteen fifty four, his house cleaner found him dead having eaten a cyanide coated apple. There have been many hypotheses surrounding his death. Some believe that Alan was killed by the state, having been found out to be a homosexual, which were considered high security risks. Others have speculated that the death was an accident since he had been experimenting with cyanide and could have forgotten he coated an apple with cyanide because that's what you do when you are experimenting, I guess. Yeah, you just like, I'm just going to rub a little cyanide here and a little cyanide here. And I'm just going to leave this in the pile with the rest of my apples. (laughs) Most people agree he committed suicide and most agree it was because of the humiliation he was forced to endure after being outed. Um, and some people think that he, um, some people even th- went as far as to say that he coated the apple on purpose so that his mother could think that he accidentally ate a cyanide laced apple rather than knowing that he actually committed suicide. That makes sense. So I don't know who knows. Obviously, we don't know what happened. Although I don't think it's very far fetched to think that the government killed him. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, absolutely not. I yeah. think that's totally something that could have happened. I right. don't, and if that's what happened, we'll never know. Well, yeah, we'll never know. It could have been either or. I mean, he did have high security clearances. And especially at this time, 1950s, this is at the height the of height, where like yeah. homosexuals are. They are communists. They are security risks to you. You got to get rid of them. You know, mm-hmm. you know, what's funny. I found that a lot of our story, our uh, episodes take place during the Lavender Scare because mm-hmm. that seems to be when most people were erased. Yeah. Yeah, that's when all this like it's mm-hmm. a it's a shift in in history where and it was like so sudden because it was like people were just starting to come out. I mean, like you hear Alan in here, he tells them he tells the police officer, you know, Parliament they're gonna they're gonna legalize homosexuality soon. Yeah, like like everyone thought that we were making these advances, but then all of a sudden it gets shoved back. Yep. So for the next fifty years, Alan, the father of the computer and of AI, was all but forgotten except in the world of technology. But in the 2000s, a renewed interest was stirred around the former war hero. Movies such as The Imitation Game and a push from Alan's ancestors sparked a wave of outrage. In 2009, the Department of Labor made a public apology for Alan Turing. And on December 24, 2013, I love when they mess up like that, um, Queen Elizabeth pardoned the disgraced hero. As a further sign of remorse, it was announced on July 15, 2019, that Turing would grace the face of the 50-pound note. We should buy one and frame it and put it up in the studio. We should. How much is it? How much extra does it cost? I think it's like 60, 70 bucks. Okay. I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah. It'd be a little investment, but it'd be something it would nice be really to have. really cool. Yeah. 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 It'd be like a piece of art almost. It, it would be. So recommended resources are any of the many books on Turing, Alan Turing, Decoded being one of the top. Also check out Imitation Game. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a ton of books on Alan Turing. Um, a lot of them are based in like like uh, also explaining the science of uh, and all the stuff that he did. So if that's your thing, you can enjoy it. Decoded was a book that was more about um, understanding his personal life as much as we have. Right. Um, and then... Uh, there was, there was other, you know, and there's some books that were negative about him, of course, but there's a lot of good books out there about him. But uh, again, a lot of them are about his research and his work and not, again, we don't know a lot about his, his mm-hmm. um, personal life. Um, but anyways, um, if you want to follow us on social media, you can. Any platform, literally anything yeah. we're on, Reddit, we're on Pinterest, we're on Twitter, we're on Tumblr, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube. We are everywhere. Just follow us at Your Queer Story, all one word. We are also on Patreon if you would like to join us, uh, mm-hmm. help support the podcast. We have plans from $1 a month all the way up to 20 and then you can choose to do however much you want. We also have merch. 
Yes. Um, if you want to wear our faces anywhere. It's still available. We have our Homocrat shirt. We have mm-hmm. our Sodomite shirt, which is still sitting there. We have not had one sale on the shot. Sodomite is, shirt, which actually really fuck? surprises me. That was like one of my favorite ones. I love the Sodomite mm-hmm. shirt. If I was still visiting Indiana, I would wear that all the time. Oh, my God. Maybe I should buy one <laughs> for when I go. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah, you should. I, I, so, I mean, we've got, we've got flip flops, then we've got the mugs, mm-hmm. we, which you can chain to your radiator. So nobody steals yeah, them from you. Do that as a protest. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of ways that you can help support us. We could use it. Um, we have more endeavors for the podcast that we'd like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do also are willing and happy to advertise for businesses and your products. We have different rate plans for that, but you can reach out to us. Again, you can your queer story at Gmail. You can reach out to us on our website, yourqueerstory.com, or on social media and, and private messaging, and we'd be happy to talk to you about our rates. Yep. Or if huh? you just want to talk. Yeah. We're not, we always love to talk to people. We love yep. when people reach out to us. So feel free to do that. Yeah. Keep reaching out. Keep talking. Keep chatting it up. And uh, thank you to our worldwide listeners and specifically to those of you in the United Kingdom and to those of you in England, in Scotland, in Ireland, in uh, Wales. Is Wales part of that? I don't know any geography. Oh, this is awful. Why, how do we do a thing on worldwide listeners and we don't even know the world? That's your job. That's It is my job. That's <laughs> I dropped the ball. I apologize. Um, so but stay yeah, clear. Don't get a lobotomy. We love you, our allied hookers. A little succulent sapphist. A little proud homocrats. Have a sodomy circus. And, um... Goodbye. Bye. (laughs)